Master in International Management from the Thunderbird School of Global Management. And he is also the Vice Chairman of the Corporate Social Responsibility Committee of the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai. After all, Richard is also a best friend of me. I'm very proud of him today to share his experiences, particularly in talking about foreign enterprises when they get into China market, how they can use CSR and sustainability to develop and grow their businesses. He will give us some good methodology cases and thinking about challenges and opportunities. Uh, Peter has a challenging time because coffee break is due very soon. So I'm asking the favor of Richard to manage his time, not only giving the speech, but also brainstorming session in a short period of time. Well done, Pete. Thank you, Richard. <coughs> Let's welcome Richard on the board. Thanks, sir. Okay. Uh, 大家好，早上好。Uh, 我非常高兴过。Hello, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. I have to apologize for the things. I will speak really fast because the time is really tight. And second, I will speak in English because because I have many foreign friends here. I so I will speak in English. And my slides is also in English. If you want the Chinese version, you can ask me or Charlie, and we will send our slides to you tomorrow by email. Thank you very much for having us this morning. I will speak quite quickly, probably to get through not only my keynote but also the panel afterwards.、Um, Dr. Liu, a great friend, and he introduced me quite well. Except he forgot that I'm also the founder of a charity in Shanghai called Hands On Shanghai. Uh, we're one of the first licensed NGOs in China as a foreign NGO. We also have a Chengdu license now, and we're now working on several other cities. We work with a number of the companies in this room, and so it's really a pleasure to kind of provide my thoughts. The title here is Beyond Business as Usual, and this is where I think the bridge between Professor Mao and also Peter really exists is that we're at a crossroads between CSR 1.0 and then the future of where it should be. So. For many of you who've been in CSR, this was what we loved, right? We wanted to do exactly what modern economics told us: make money, but then obey the laws, employ people, pay some taxes, and donate your time or money when you have it. It's a traditional CSR model, and that, for many years, for the last 15 in China that I've been doing this, was the primary kind of strategy. But this is changing, and I'm really going to get into that because there's there's two ways to look at CSR. The first one is external, which is what I will really spend most of my time on—the market focus of how you sell or leverage CSR. The other one is internal, about what it means to your company from a culture for your employees. And I would say that for CSR 101, the traditional definition, the only competitive advantage that it really provides to the firm is internal. And that comes in the way of volunteering and what it does to promote culture, employer retention, productivity within your firm. And I'm going to show you one statistical chart, which is basically it's a it's a survey that we did of 800 employees at one of the, the largest firms in China, to show what does volunteering do for the firm. And again, I will send this to anyone who would request it, but I'm just going to show you three things. And what you'll see is the orange and red. Are agree and highly agree. Increased product volunteering does three things. It increases employee productivity and loyalty. So, let's see. turn this on. So this one here is participating in company projects increases my work satisfaction. About ninety eighty percent said agree or strongly agree. It increases brand value and advocacy. So the first chart shows. Basically, the, the employee believes by about the margin of 85 percent that a strong culture of volunteering, they will talk more about their firm. It enhances the brand's value in the market. The second one is, even if they don't like their job, they will tell others about how good their company is because of a strong value or commitment to volunteering. 
And the third one is it increases team cohesion and leadership. So 89% said volunteering is a fun way to increase kind of the team spirit, which I think a lot of firms need. And the second one is 88%, I believe I improve my leadership skills by volunteering. Now for me, for CSR, this has been the biggest value, this is the biggest differentiator for most of my clients now who are by and, more, by and large focused more internally on how to lever CSR than externally now. But really where we're headed, because of the, the externalities that both Mao Yushir and also Peter were talking about, the modern economy has not protected the environment, society, or the economy in the way that we had planned. And what this means is, from a market-facing perspective, we have to look at CSR quite differently. And to go back to Milton Friedman, there's only, th basically profiting is the way, is the main source of social responsibility for the firm, as long as it stays within the rules of the road. And I ask that you keep that last sentence in your mind while I'm speaking, because the rules of the road are changing. So if you look at the fact that most of us will be operating or advising to very complex value chains in China, right? You have manufacturing, you have sales. 20 years ago, maybe the most of the multinational factories were here, but they were selling overseas. And what we're seeing is that the value chain is coming into China, and this is placing a different pressure. Because as smog becomes a personal issue, and citizens start to f force the issue on brands, it's changing the way that firms feel that they need to be socially responsible or responsible to different stakeholders. And we will look at who is responsible for taking action. Actually, if you look at it, most people don't think that corporates will take action. They actually believe that the government, no surprise in China, will be the primary force for change in China. They will be the ones that force responsibility. But individuals who feel they have very little power, actually fit, they will take action. Now the reason why I put this chart up here is because corporations don't feel like they have to act. But the question is, who will this group and who will this group act against? They will act against business. They will have different expectations. And that will come in the form of two ways. What I call push and pull. And I'll just use this chart. Imagine the way that a government can force a corporation to change its business behavior, its business as usual practice. One is laws, enforcement of laws, but the other one is incentives. And getting back to Peter's ideas about you know, the, the closed loop economy, a lot of it is very much going to be about incentive based. Invest here if you're a green industry. Invest here if you're low emissions. Invest here if you are low energy. We want to drive the economy differently and we can provide incentives or rules that help you get there, right? If you don't conform to our new laws, we can push you out of our city, out of our province, out of our region to move west. Or we can push you out of China. And we see that happening more and more. But individuals, this is the hardest one, particularly the brands, the B2Cs that we work with. B2B, still quite insulated, still more government than it is individual. But for the brands, they're seeing this from the consumers. And I'll show an example in a few minutes. And I apologize. I am kind of helping you out on time here. So what I want to just mention is that the rules of the road are really changing. Old traditional economics is changing because the resources are getting scarce. But also because the expectations of individuals are gaining speed. One of the things that neither of them spoke about yet that I, I would like to speak about is the fact that Chinese individuals, as consumers or citizens, have changed their mindset about what it means to have a lifestyle over the last 15 to 20 years, particularly in the last five, as wealth has come into the major cities, even to the second tier cities. They now expect more from everyone around them, be it their neighbors, the brands they purchase, the government who represents them, whatever it may be. And that creates more pressure as well. The pressure is coming from both sides. So kind of the, the three things that we really look at when we're working with our firms is basically the rules of the road are no longer set by the government alone. 
going back to Milton Friedman's quote from 1971, government was the primary establisher of rules and regulations, especially in China. That's changing. Now it's citizens who will come to your factory and air grievances. It's media who will highlight your problems. It's NGOs who will help the whole process. It's also consumers who say, we'll no longer buy your goods if you're not responsible. The second one is, as your firm moves from production only in China to production and consumption, this gets more challenging as well because you can no longer exploit the same population that you're profiting from or vice versa, profit from the group that you're exploiting. So you think of 1997, Nike in Indonesia. It took American consumers to put pressure on Nike before they acted in Indonesia. But now Chinese consumers can act against a brand who's exploiting, in their mind, the Chinese. It's a very different scenario because it allows NGOs and media to get far more engaged. And the last one is, which I'll talk about, is compliance mindsets. The idea that I'm complying with the law is hurting the long-term strategy of firms. It's a tactic that only has a short-term lead time on it. The more you say, I'm following the law, I'm following the law, the farther you are falling behind. And there's many companies that I'll show coming up that basically fail, fell into that trap. Here's a small list of those companies. Just in the last 18 months in China, have been fined, have been seen consumer boycott, have been closed down. Because what happens when your compliance mindset is you're not staying innovative, you're not staying productive, you're not addressing the needs of the wider community, particularly consumers. Your license to operate can be removed by the government, but also by citizens and consumers now. Look at Yum, KFC. How many scandals have they seen in the last three years that have set their firm backwards, not because they broke the law or the, the standards that were set by the Shanghai Food and Drug Administration, but because consumers didn't trust the product. The consumer expectation was higher than the government's expectation. And that was their license to operate as business as usual changed. Reputations can be caused damage by NIMBY and government action. Um, Johnson Controls, Siemens, GlaxoSmithKline all fell into this problem. Be it corruption or be it the fact that they were emitting pollution near residential communities. They can be moved out, they can be shut down. And finally, the one that I think that we're getting to, the one that's going to move us from a position where CSR is separate from the firm strategy to one where we have a real closed-looped economy, is when the finance community comes around really in full force and starts to finance firms very differently. We're seeing this in some of the industries that Peter was talking about, particularly coal and the, the dirty industries, but we haven't quite seen it fully come, circle, come full circle yet in terms of SRI funds having a full kind of seat at the board. It's coming, it's certainly something that's gonna happen, but that's one of the things that we really see is needing more time before the full closed-loop economy comes around. So, basically we just put forward that inaction or delayed change will basically weaken the firm's position. And a good position is when you have the time, you're right, you know your stakeholders, and you're flexible. But being in a bad position is when you're in the middle of a crisis, you're wrong. Again, the rules of the road may not be who the, the, by, set by the government, but you're wrong by consumers, you're wrong by citizens, you're wrong by the media. You don't know who your stakeholders are. Your GR department failed to understand the needs of the community and the pressure that it would have on government versus just talking to the government. And then you don't know the needs. You don't know how to respond. And this is really where firms are going to move. We're seeing primarily from CSR 1.0 to 2.0. So for us, there's five steps forward if you want to get ahead of the curve. The one thing is you have to rethink risk and responsibility. You can no longer rely on the rules set by government as the only measure of where your firm should be responsible. It has to be a far wider group of individuals, of stakeholders, and of process. You have to invest. It's not just about donating money or volunteering time, which I would say are great first steps for any firm that's not sure what to do. They're great first steps if you're only focused on culture and building HR. But if you're really worried about market, 
you have to invest in a very different thing. Different people, different process, different product. You have to make the adjustments. A lot of firms, Yum being one of them, Apple being others, automotive, textiles, we see this across industry. You make a little burn about this big in your room. A traditional carpet has to be completely ripped up, 99% waste. The hotel loses three days, right? Because they got to take it up, move all the furniture, move everyone out. Then they lay it back down. An airplane is the exact same way. It takes three days to replace the carpet on an airplane. They do that 10 times a year. So as a hotelier or as an airline, you lose a lot of time through that process. He designed it so it's modular. You can take up one piece and lay it down, three minutes, you're done. Saves a lot of money for firms, right? And it was this idea that used biomimicry. Well, the most impressive project I've seen they did in Asia now is called Networks. And what this is doing is they've gone from we comply, we do everything that we're told to, to some product innovation, to now taking product innovation to the point where they're removing natural, basically waste and turning it into a natural resource. They're doing what Peter was talking about, the, the LCA theory. And I'm going to show a quick movie about how they did this. All right, so I'm also going to ask, I'm also going to end with several questions. When you think about the rules of the road changing, what are the areas of your business that you feel are the most exposed going forward? If you're in food, textile, electronics, you're a brand who's a retail brand. If it's in production and materials, areas you don't own, how do you control the risk, right? You're outsourcing. If you're a B2B servicing the brands, how do you create a new vision going forward? Because then the big question comes, who's the change agent? Like, what is it going to take before your industry gets hit like the electronics industry or like the fast food industry? It doesn't take much, but what's the event that you're not thinking about? Who's the person who will start it? Maybe one person on Weibo or on Weixin, right? They don't need to be very popular. They don't need to be very good looking. But the right message from them can catalyze a crisis in your industry, if not your brand. What would be the impact to your brand if you got caught now? And you got caught in a way that much like Yum, much like Apple, much like others have gone through in China, where the Chinese consumers say, we're not going to buy your product until you change. Right? Think of San Lu milk. Think of what happened after that crisis. The entire dairy industry in China was hit. So therefore, my last question is, What's your opportunity to take a step forward today? What can you do today to help your firm proactively reduce risk, but also build a new brand that will sustain for the future, that has a new vision, that addresses human needs in an economically sustainable way? Thank you very much, and I will now take questions. I have to say anyway, because the next panel is coming up here. Exactly. So <laughs> please, thank you, uh, Richard. Well done. Appreciate it. <coughs> so let's put our hands together for his presentation. So we can see Richard is a very passionate speaker, and he can also give us a lot of in-depth thought. Maybe it's not too much. <laughs> So I'm going to occupy, occupy a few minutes to share my thoughts. Actually, his presentation has triggered a lot of thoughts in me. I think especially for a lot of CEOs, presidents today, vice presidents, and also chairmen. Actually, actually, he has talked that while the enterprises are transforming, so their expectation about the government. So the expectation for the enterprise to action is actually 15. Actually, for the government, is 42.7 percent. So people believe that the reform are driven by the government. Actually, last week in uh, Fudan University, I attended the meeting. So I, while I was chatting with the Bowell, he said that. 
during reform, there should be very significant interaction between the business and the government, and normally the business will play a very important role. So Richard has said that the enterprises need to take a proactive way and turn challenges into opportunities for the CEOs and presidents. I think th this topic is very helpful. He has over also given us five questions. So we need to consider about our risks and what are our opportunities. We need to rethink where do we start with and what do we need to make adjustment. And for issues, how do we openly negotiate with all stakeholders so that we can facilitate our future development? Actually, the last point he made is that not to blame the others. Actually, for us who are engaged in CSR, this is a very essential part. So, apart from the professional methodology strategy, we also need to have a very good humanistic spirit. So, we need to have an international outlook, and we also need to have a humanistic spirit so that we will not blame the others. We can have more inclusion and carry our work in a more constructive way. So I would like you to give another round of applause to Richard. Next. Again, that is a brainstorming session, and he will invite four uh, panelists to go through a discussion with him. I know you have questions, so Richard, if you permit maybe two questions, then the rest can get into your panel session so people can keep asking. Certainly. Okay, so we open the questions to the floor. Two questions. So the lady in the back row. I want to say thank you, Richard, for founding Hands on Shanghai. It's a great organization. I'm a huge fan of Hands on Shanghai. All right. Uh, I totally agree with you that probably meeting uh, the requirement of law is the minimum requirement for companies, while the citizens and media and employees can have higher requirements. Uh, so I would like to hear your insights on um, employee engagement versus the corporate social responsibility. Could you please say something about that? Thank you. I would say in the industries that we've been working in the most recently, being chemical, textile, electronic, and food, employee retention is a huge problem. Um, I know some firms are struggling with 20 to 30 percent turnover rates right now. Um, factories seeing 60 to 70. And so I think that having a strong culture of responsibility, redefining what it means to be good to your employees, not just paying minimum wage in the sujin, right, but also really looking like what are the things that they worry about every day as an employee but more as a person. So to kind of give you two um, examples, I was talking with an electronics firm, and I've, I've, we've done quite a bit here, where you know they have a university that they're trying to build. They were one of the groups that was well known in the press for having problems. They've built a university basically dedicated to their, you know, three quarters of a million to million factory workers to become better educated. Now if you think back about migrant populations and factories, it used to be that the migrant would come two to three years, work in the factory, go home, you know, and then live their life back in their home village or province or city. But that's changing. The, you know, they're becoming citizens, the Xin Shanghai run, the Xin, you know, Beijing run, the Xin Wuhan run, right? Because what they're expecting is not to come to the city and go home, but to come to the city and make a home. And that's a real big challenge for a lot of firms. So what we look at is, first, for responsibility's sake, stop treating your employees as if they're going to go home. Start developing policies and programs that help them integrate into the city. Help them gain higher access to higher education, higher skills, and look to your staff to become middle management. It used to be that staff went home or that factory went home,
But now if you look at them as a pool for the future of your leadership, it's a different because you're investing in them. So they will stabilize. The second thing I think that's going to be actually really challenging for firms to figure out how to do this is the aging population of China, but also the number of young families who occupy middle management. These individuals are going to have a lot of stress because you have to either leave work early or hire someone to help you support your family, be them young or old. And for me, I, I employ, I don't know, 25, 30 people now. We're very flexible. We've had almost 25, you know, like 30% of my staff has gone on maternity leave, and we give them extra time. The other group now is starting to worry about their elderly, their parents, because you, know, you can't have two sets of parents and the family and the children living in one house. It's too expensive. It's also too expensive to expect that you know, the husband and wife would go back and forth without the support of their business. And I think this is what's really going to change how you view response. You have to look at them as individuals. You have to increase flex time. You also have to be flexible about where the office is and what they're expected to do in the office. And actually, just the last comment, that 2025 workshop that we did with BSF, one of them was the future of work in 2025. What will the office look like? And categorically, everyone said, small office, hub for meetings, but not doing work, with most employees working near the home versus in the office. Because the other thing that's changing is traffic. If you live in Beijing, you can go an hour, hour and a half just trying to get to work. I know people in Shanghai that go to factories that are an hour and a half, two hours. We, that will end because employee expectations will rise. And then we can talk about volunteering, and then we can talk about philanthropy. But I think if we're talking about employees and engagement, it has to be about them as an individual. One more question. <laughs> or that's too much. You speak very fast. I speak very fast, and I apologize. So one simple question. There's a, um, a little bit long statement. I'm from a European bank, and we uh, take um, junior education very seriously. Mm -hmm. um, that's why we set up a sponsor uh, scholarship in Sichuan, in a uh, really small village, which is known to nobody. But the kids there need a lot of financial support to continue their study and even their life spending because their parents are the migrants in big cities, and they never go home. Um, but the question is, um, there's another voice within the bank that you guys should sponsor, uh, should uh, spend money on the CSR program in Shanghai in this neighborhood because it's logistically easier and it saves a lot of time and uh, probably a lot of um, financial investment through the programs. And it's, it's, also, it's also a very good method to cater to the local government agency's demands. But... Um, in w the uh, evaluation from the CSR committee is the kids in Sichuan needs our help most because nobody else would uh, go there to give their money to, and to study is probably the only way for the kids to get out of the village in their life. So it's uh, very hard to balance the two options and that's a lot of uh, multinational companies are facing um, to do something the local government wants or to do something which is more in line um, with their global principle. Yeah. So do you that's have it. any suggestions? Um, yeah, so this is actually, it's, it's a very good, this is strategy. It's not either or, you can do both. And I think the important thing is to understand that one, the resources required to do both are different, the expectations are different, and how you'll do them is differently. I personally think that every firm needs to do four things in China from a CSR perspective, just in the context of your question. If you're a global company, you need to have a global partnership. Um, Save the Children, WWF, Greenpeace, whoever, uh, Greenpeace doesn't take corporate money, so, you know, WWF, whoever, right? You have to have that global programming. The second one is you need to have a China program. You need to have something that your corporate office has all of your offices work on. It could be a donation, it could be a day of volunteering, it could be one-off. Because that builds kind of this excitement, this punch, event-based, that you can gather people around. The third thing is you need to have the local program. The local program is the stuff that engages individual employees on a regular basis in the heart. It's what they want, not what the management team wants, not what the executives back home wants, but what they want to do. You give them a small budget, you allow them to run it, 
and that will help build a culture. And the fourth thing is you have to have disaster response. We saw this in 2008. If you don't have your money ready and willing to give, you are a gongji, and that's not a good place to be, right? <laughs> so you really have to have a structured strategy, I think, to CSR if you only want to talk about donations and volunteering. To answer your question, I think you should have both. I think you should give to Sichuan. I don't know if you have an office there. You know, a lot of banks are moving there. Okay, you don't. Um, you know, the other reason why you would do things that are, you know, maybe a little bit further afield, you're planning for the future, right? A lot of firms are going to move to either Chongqing. Not me. He's you. All right. It's not me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> apologies. I think it's the guy in the back. Um, <laughs> you know, you, don't blame others. Oh, don't blame others. Oh, yes. Okay. Here. Hold my phone. It's not me. I'm telling you. All right. There we go. So, oh, now it stops. See, nope. Okay, so you have to, because one thing is, by 2025, I'm going to assume that if you are a retail bank, you'll have a presence in Chongqing or Chengdu. If you're an investment bank, you may also have one there as well, because, see, he's got my phone. It's not me. Um, and basically, you're going to move 2025. But locally, you need to also think about that as well. The, the larger spend can go to Sichuan if you want, because that can come from your, your China-level budget. But local budgets... Really try and spend that on things, not even, not even that are just like within Shanghai, but close to your office. Uh, we were working with the lady in front of you on hers and the volunteering program. They're off to Plaza 66. We, went, we started them off with a children's hospital in Beijing, Lu, just because if you can get someone to walk out of the office to the hospital, to the Lao Yuan, to the Yang Guang Zhijia, to the Jada, whatever, right, you're extending their idea of what community means. And that is another long-term goal for the Shanghai city. You have all these people coming in from all over China and the world now. The sense of community has changed. And what we need to do is build community. The more community you can build in your firm, within your local area, the stronger your program is going to be, the more cohesion you're going to see in it, and the more loyalty you're going to find to the program. People are going to be excited. And that's what you really want. So you can do both. And Thank you, you uh, Richard. Thank you very much. He's cutting it out. Okay. <laughs> My phone back. Thanks. Um, next, Richard is going to organize a panel discussion. Next, Richard is going to organize a panel discussion. Probably Richard, the introduction. His panel discussion. So please now allow me to welcome the panelists on the stage. Pudong New District Government Director Hu Jianhua. Let's uh, welcome. China Textile Institution Chief Researcher and uh, Vice Deputy Director Dr. Liang Xiaohui. Green News Edition from Southern Weekend. Supervisor for the editor, Mr. Zhu Hongjun. Mr. Calvin Kirk from Greenpeace, Head of Sustainable Finance Program. As for the morning agenda, we are delayed for 20 minutes already, so I want to say thank you for your understanding. As for Richard, I want you to finish this in 25 minutes. So thank you very much. Make it a little bit easier for myself and for time as well. Um, I'm not going to ask that they actually introduce themselves. I really want to get into the Q&A quickly because I think that this, there's a lot of talent and knowledge up here, and I want to make sure that we tap that as much as possible while we have each of these four gentlemen. So first off, thank you all for joining us this afternoon, or this morning. Our topic is really around the idea of obstacles um, for CSR, what CSR will do, and whether or not it's fair that there's maybe two standards between foreign and Chinese enterprises. We're also going to look a little bit about the opportunities and challenges going forward. And so I would just like to ask each one of you maybe to address, we have a really interesting group here. We have someone from the textile industry, which historically had many challenges in CSR, environmentally, socially, economically. And we also have four or three others who here represent media as well as academia as well as NGOs. And so in a sense, the three of you would have been seen as kind of contestants to the industry itself. You would have had ideas about how it should change, about the problems that were faced. 
So first I'd like to ask um, Mr. Hu, um, could you please speak about maybe your ideas, you know, in, in Pudong? Um, what are the challenges? How have, what are the challenges that you feel that you face when it comes to CSR in Pudong or at the Shanghai level? And what do you think that your district is doing to really help provide the resources or the programs for companies to be better better uh, citizens? Thank you very much. I'm from Pudong, New District. Among all of the regional government in China, Pudong New District is one of the first adopters. As for Pudong New District the government, since 2007, up till now, CSR has been further promoted for seven years. Up till today, we have some quick summarizes. We have achieved four number ones already. First of all, in May 2007, Pudong New District is already setting up a CSR management system targeting the companies. The companies had four character functions. It is guided by the government, self-regulated by the industry, managed by the company, and supervised by the society. These are the four features for such a system we established. The second number one is, starting from 2009, Pudong New District had set up a new local regulation and standard. We are setting up a new standard for the companies in regarding CSR. We are the very first to do so in China, and we are the only one even till now. The third number one is, in 2011, we published the very first Social, social responsibility competitiveness in the local region. That is a specific index. We published a standardized system as well. And the fourth number one is, in our district, we initiated the very first CSR fundraising. This year, in September, we published a white paper book for CSR in Pudong District. So for all of the five moves, these are some of the main work we have been doing. Dr. Liang, uh, let me ask you a question. You're both a lawyer as well as kind of the textile industry group. As the government itself starts to create a better understanding, a better vision, a better structure for CSR. How do you feel it helps you both as, I think you're, I think they're wait, waiting for my mic. How does that help you in terms of the industries that you work with to better, for them to also better understand what they should do, but also from the, the lawyer's perspective, how much easier is it when the government itself has a very clear vision for what responsibility means? So thank you very much. So I can share with you my understanding. I got two backgrounds, just like Richard has explained. I'm from China Textile Committee. I'm responsible for the CSR work. I'm also teaching law in universities. So I got a lawyer background as well. I think that was a really good question Richard had asked. For the past years, I have always been thinking how CSI in China can be further developed. One question always comes to my mind. It is, what exactly should we do? What is our ultimate goal? Richard talked about government guidance is crucial, but for China, it might be slightly different. I think it can be the opposite in China. In China, the business is more advanced than the government, and they are doing a better job than the government. We have the leader from New S, uh, from Pudong District, talking about the five number ones. 
actually for textile industry, back to 2007, we already set up a strategy and a framework. And we got our very first CSR report published in the textile industry. We obviously say textile is targeting all society, and we know the market even more profound than the other industries. I think to maintain a competitive environment, it's very important for CSR. Personally speaking, after so many years of being involved, talking about CSR too much might not be exactly correct. What's more important is to understand what CSR means for us. Why should we do it? Recently, we noticed something very interesting. I will not judge it's correct or not. But like Director Chu had said about the regulatory and the new legislation about the CSR, in this new law, what should we regulate? It means that the government is looking at the CSR already, but for President Xi Jinping, he is personally an advocate of CSR. But seems the government is already trying to do something, and it is further enhanced to the national level. But exactly what should we do? We don't know yet. In the article, what should we write? We don't know either. As Direct True has mentioned earlier, several points are covered. We need to have a specific law talking about CSR. That seems something not so correct in my point of view, because we don't need a specific legislation for CSR. We have all existing articles ready. It is all about execution. So we don't need an additional law to regulate the company again. Whether it's for the environmental protection, for the labor force, a lot of the law has been there. A lot of the standard has really high bars, even higher than abroad. I will only give two examples. For example, the working hour in China is higher than the international standard. The emission requirement is also more strict than the developed countries. The trend is good. But what about execution? In the legislation, we already considered what we want to achieve in the future, but the problem is how to make actions. If we do want to have an additional law for CSR, I don't think that is the correct thing to do. What we should do is how to set up the mechanism instead of talking about CSR alone. For creating such an environment, you need a framework. We have the article, we have the laws already. We need to set up a mechanism to make sure this law can be executed. That is more important in my point of view. I think we need to integrate the valuation into the strategy. You need to manage your own influence to the society. As we also encourage third-party integration and participation. Fourth point, we need to further explain CSR towards the whole supply chain. All of these experiences we can learn from others, but we need to put it to a full mechanism instead of compulsorily push the company to obey the law. What we do is to take advantage of these mechanisms, set up a full framework. So in order to achieve this law, this is what I think I should do next. Next question I'd like to address both Calvin as well as to Hongjun. I mean, in the past five to eight years, both the media and NGOs become valuable kind of collaborators in really moving the agendas forward in social and environmental economic considerations, where once in the past maybe you didn't have so much leeway. What are the ch what's the big change that you've seen over the last few years, and how do you think, I mean, the vision that both of these gentlemen put out would very much map to what I put out there as well, the, the challenges that, that academics as well as the government are facing. Where do you think we're, we're going to go over the next 10, 15, 20, like what's the gap that we need to close to find real responsibility in these companies, to move from great laws to... Uh, <coughs> Thank you very much. I read the agenda for our meeting, actually. Seems I'm the only rapper from media to share with what we think. I was in some similar conference before. 
in a really good hotel, talking about CSR. It feels like in China, we have a lot of models for CSR. We have a lot of systems. Seems we are innovating a lot as well, and uh, there are a lot of social responsible reports from different companies. On the other hand, since I'm in the media, and we got in touch with the latest information, in China we have food safety. We have a lot of energy emission dilemma. We are still having a huge gap. There are a lot of state-owned enterprises. They are huge in scale, but the, the credibility is very low among the public. Every year, we have some emergency or some incidents. I think, in my point of view, from the macro point of view, it seems the trend is well. But in the micro perspective, we are still in a mess. It might not be exactly correct, but that's my point of view. In the past, we have been focusing on low carbon, on public safety, food safety. It is an integrational part of sustainable development. In the past few years, we are trying to value the foreign companies in China. We want to rate the different companies according to how green they are. For the past five years, we do find something different. I think, in the perspective of CSR, we have not that many external compulsoriness. There are a lot of organization as a third party to manage the CSR and monitor the CSR response of the company. We don't have that many. We don't have a lot of grassroots organization. For example, we have Greenpeace. They have been very consistent in doing so. We don't have a lot of voice from the consumer group. Their power is still really weak. So every year, when we collect data, we don't find enough resources. Secondly, to the company side, the company is not transparent enough towards CSR, particularly when it involves with certain questions and problems. CSR more it's like a KPI. It's not something real. Since last year, there are a lot of famous companies because the Ministry of Environment is monitoring Sinopec and the CNPC. They are saying that they got environmental pollution and they are not doing so good. But looking at the CSR report of Sinopec and the CNPC, they didn't mention it at all. Just by a short conclusion and the same period of time, in their own CSR report, what they say is so not the realistic performance. I think the transparency issue is very serious. And for Sinopec, they are supposed to be a benchmark SOE, but they are not doing so. The third part, as a media, we need to take the responsibility as well. Under the Chinese status, we need to show more responsibilities. But including media for any industry, we are experiencing a crossroad, a very important turning point as well. For China media industry, apart from how we can survive the future, how we are facing the pressure from the new media, how should the media industry survive as a whole? The CSR might not be the main functionality of media for now. In media, we do have experienced many issues ourselves. So I would like to say, as a media in China, we need to clean ourselves. We need to regulate ourselves as well. That's what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, but before I answer the question, I just want to. I I think for Southern Weekly, the report and the articles you issued, they are very, 
accurate. I am a Singaporean and I have been living in China for six years. Personally speaking, in the very first, I thought Chinese media are not so objective, but I started to read Southern Weekly and I was amazed by the article and I do support your work. A few, um, a few comments, I guess. Uh, it's a lot of things in my head and there's a lot of different things, uh, law, media, companies. and I, I think I would just end with, I'll just make this one point, is that absolutely companies need to uh, uh, adhere to the law and their highest standards I talk about. Uh, but from the environmental uh, group's perspective, I would say that given the challenges we face globally from an environmental standpoint, and the biggest uh, might possibly be climate change, unfortunately, we are far, far from reaching that goal at this point in time. And I think another key role that companies can play uh, in trying to save the world as it is, is also to be themselves uh, change agents and also to influence and also to provide advice to the government, particularly here in China. So, so this gentleman over here, about how he brings uh, companies together and gives advice, I think is absolutely key. Uh, because I think this exchange between the private sector and, the, and, the, and, and, and policymakers is absolutely key for fundamentally addressed major challenges such as climate change. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. I'll make it a short one that, again, each of you I'll, I'll ask. Two questions. The first one is, what's the industry in China that you feel will have the most challenge going forward to 2025, be it resource or be it labor, be it a, a crisis? And then what's a firm, Chinese firm, that you believe is doing it right? What's a, what's a brand that you think that others can learn from or a leader perhaps? I mean, obviously, you know, Ma Yun is also very popular these days, but, you know, who's someone that you would like to say, like, to give credit to that maybe normally doesn't get credit? So from Pudong Neo area, so while we are promoting CSR, so, so you have recommended BAS, BASF. I think they are doing a very good job and they are also developing very well and for CSR and they are not doing that for their own enterprise. They also expand that to the supply chain. So they have a very complete CSR campaigns. They are not only doing very well within their company, they also have requirements for their stakeholders in their supply chain. I think that will be very promising. So about the industries with the biggest challenges, I agree to everything the others have said. But I'm very glad that you didn't mention about the government's industry. I th and for the second question, I would not say what companies are doing well. But I want to say that actually there are a lot of unsung heroes. Sometimes they are very uh, small enterprises that are doing a very good job. Uh, the day before yesterday, I went to an enterprise. It's not very small, but it's an, on the manufacturing chain. So I stayed there for two days, and I was very moved. I want to give you some examples. Actually, a lot of multinationals haven't done that. One example is from the workshop to the canteens. There is a road, so that employees need to go through that every day. So the management group said we need to plant flowers and trees because they feel that the mood from the work to dinner will determine the mood for the whole day. I think that is a very good idea because they link that with the employees' demands and needs. Second example, very interesting. Although it's very difficult for recruitment, but every time when we have a newcomer, we will treat them. So, uh, we we'll take it as a wedding day. So, so, so we will never think about divorce while we get married. 
So they pay a lot of attention to the process and their commitment to the employees, and they've written that, that in paper. I think those kind of acts sometimes are just some small things, which will help them to build the brand. So uh, it doesn't mean that if I name the enterprise, actually, I think all the enterprises can do a good job in that. First of all, I would say the food industry is by far going to be the most challenged. I do also believe that energy is going to be a big crisis, but for different reasons. Um, food for us is all very personal. We're seeing multiple crises all the time. OSI, which is in Pudong, right, having a problem. Um, I would like to ask that each of you make a small contribution to responsibility by drinking your water before you go to the coffee break. If you don't drink it, they will take it and throw it away, which is a massive waste of energy and water and an opportunity lost for personal responsibility. And finally, I'd like to thank the panelists. I thank all of you. I hope we're almost back on time. Thank you very much. Have a great break. Ten minutes for break? Fifteen?